Welcome to today's program, Employee Termination and Data Repatriation in the Remote Work Environment. Copies of the slides, a link to the recording, and the CLE verification form will be emailed to you in the days following the webinar. During the program, a CLE code will be read aloud and you will be required to include this code on the CLE form. Throughout the webinar, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box on your screen. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Bob Stevens. Good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending upon where you are listening to this webinar today. Uh, my name is Bob Stevens. Uh, we appreciate you coming. I've been with uh, practicing law for 25 years and dealing with, unfortunately, employees leaving and taking data. And as you might imagine, things have changed over the last 25 years. And we're going to talk a lot today about what happens in the remote world. A couple of panelists joining me today are Matt Simmons. He's a new addition to the Sidefar Shaw firm at our senior counsel in our Houston office. Matt's an employment litigator, and his practice focuses on unfair competition lawsuits representing plaintiffs and defendants. Matt's licensed both in Texas and Florida, but represents clients throughout the United States. And our final panelist who will kick us off today uh, is Rick Lutkus. Rick's one of the world's only lawyers who is also certified as a certified ethical hacker and a certified digital forensic expert. And that's for real, that's not an April's Fool joke, he can explain it to you. Uh, his practice is dedicated to high-tech investigations and cybersecurity. He has 15 years of experience assisting clients in dealing with data, uh, and potential theft of data. He's also an attorney who codes. And with that, I'll hand it over to Rick to start off our webinar. Yeah, we can go to the next slide to kind of go over the overview here. So uh, this is the brief agenda. I won't spend too many time, too much time on it. Just wanted to kind of uh, let everyone see where we're going to be headed with this. So uh, uh, appreciate Bob doing the introduction. The ethical hacker thing is real. It just means I uh, I use my knowledge of uh, hacking experience and and techniques for the good. So I'm considered a white hat hacker. The bad guys are considered black hat hackers. And then there's this weird middle ground called gray hat, which is people that kind of operate in both sometimes. Uh, but uh, without further ado, let's jump into the first section, which is uh, talking about cybersecurity, data privacy, and compliance issues that we've seen uh, in the last 12 months. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. So I want to start by really framing the issue that uh, is really beguiling corporations as of this, you know, this time period I just mentioned. Uh, and this is really kind of the COVID versus IT paradigm. Uh, what what a lot of companies found themselves contending with is uh, is their IT departments having to suddenly mobilize large groups of their workforce that were potentially not remote before uh, and enabling a remote work for them uh, in a very short time frame? I mean, we, we had some indications of COVID in January, February, and then suddenly there was a lot of remote work uh, starting in March for a lot of people. Uh, and IT departments essentially had to, had to pivot immediately, expand their systems, set up the proper security procedures and things for people to be able to log in who otherwise wouldn't have before. And as a result, you know, there was there were some growing pains there. There was a lot of infrastructure struggles. There was, you know, there weren't enough servers, there weren't enough licenses. There was uh, kind of a rush to get, get it done as an operational uh, requirement for the business to continue operating. So in a, a lot of situations, we saw security being set aside a little bit or at least put on a less, um, a less prioritized position uh, in this behind convenience and the ability to have business continuity, which is your workers accessing what they need to. So we also saw software being deployed quickly without the usual amount of testing uh, and validation, uh, you know, to really support these workers uh, on a uh, on the you know the, the remote turn on as we would call it. So what what we then saw is everyone started working remotely and getting used to that. But then there was this other kind of effect that became uh, apparent after IT started uh, started this you know these programs is that employees were starting to do things their own way and maybe not using all the official enterprise or organization wide uh, licensed software. They started saying, "Well, you know, I, I'm going to be using my phone to take calls. I'm going to be you know using Dropbox. I'll be doing whatever I have to do to work." Uh, and it, in a lot of cases, it just people did whatever they could to get their work done uh, 
with whatever they had around. And so people were kind of, you know, going outside the norm of, of what the corporations expected. So what this resulted in is there was, uh, as I mentioned here in the slide, you know, different sorts of services and things that, that employees started using. Uh, one of the things that was a big problem was that, you know, personal devices were connecting to the network, uh, the networks of organizations that didn't really have antivirus and anti-malware software that, uh, uh, that organizations would normally have deployed. And so you had untrusted devices, as we call them, connecting to corporate networks, which is an issue. The other problem we found was that corporations lost a little bit of the ability to control where their data was. Uh, and there's obviously a couple issues that that, that raises, uh, namely in litigation holds uh, and data preservation, because now you're trying to find where is your data at on potentially other personal devices that they were using. You have data privacy compliance. Now your customer and employee data might be residing on a home computer, for example, or uh, in a you know a home file sharing service like Box or something. And so you have privacy issues with that as well. And so this da as data was being saved outside the normal locations, uh, corporations started losing control of knowing exactly where the data was, and therefore couldn't really exhibit or couldn't really put in place the controls necessary to to uh, to understand where it is and how to deal with it. So you also, you know, had all these all these issues going on and you also had offboarding workflows that were interrupted because IT was focused on supporting the remote workforce. So I just wanted to kind of frame all the all the different things that we saw from the IT consulting and, and advisory um, side of things. So let's go on to the next slide. And so this is kind of the what I was mentioning earlier. It's you know, employees were struggling with remote work. And as a result, they, they still needed to get their work done. And so they started finding workarounds and without proper controls and, and network level filtering and your VPN, employees were able to essentially sign up for any service they wanted and use that to try to collaborate and things. So if they didn't have the tools provided by the enterprise, they would just figure out whatever they could uh, and use that. And so, as you can see, I, this is an invented quote, but, um, it's one that I'm sure was said thousands of times, maybe millions uh, in the past year. And it kind of frames the issue of uh, this kind of shadow IT of, of employees using things that weren't sanctioned uh, to conduct their work. Next slide. So the other problem that uh, came up is, is really the, the attack vectors that uh, hackers started using. They were fully aware that COVID was going on, obviously. Uh, and they chose to use that vulnerability to exploit employees. And so what we saw is this work from home gave the attackers a, a different a, a ability or a new ability to, uh, to basically try to prey on these employees who are already struggling with remote work. So what we saw was the attackers started uh, changing their tactics. They, they made a lot of COVID focused type of communications to try to trick people. And this came in the in the form of a few things. The first would be phishing emails. These are typically your, you know, your dodgy emails that come in asking you to click a link or download a PDF and open it, uh, or otherwise drives your attention to something like a fake website. Uh, in in the case of credential harvesting, uh, or even what's called smishing, which is sending you a link on your phone uh, to click a link and and again harvest your credentials. A lot of times those come through as like you have a FedEx delivery coming. Uh, or you have a, you know, you have DoorDash or, or some sort of delivery service, which during parts of the early COVID times were pretty important. Like you were out of toilet paper and it said, hey, your, your delivery is coming from Amazon. You're like, oh, great. You'd click on anything. And, and so they were actually using this, this uh, you know, kind of fear and weakness uh, to, to really attack employees. And the purpose was obviously to try to extort them for money and Bitcoin through ransomware, but also steal information like wire instructions or IP. And so what we saw was a, a, a big uptick in the attacks that were taking place on vulnerable employees without proper enterprise controls in place. And so there was a huge, a very heightened risk of, of attack. And, and a lot of those attacks were sadly successful because of the, the state people were in, you know, trying to contend with the mental uh, realities of COVID, working at home, you know, kids kids home from school. It was a uh, an extremely vulnerable time. Let's go to the next uh, next slide. So pri the privacy issues related to this, uh, you know, are are I, I won't, this could be an entirely separate topic, but um, 
you know, for anyone who, who deals in data privacy as, their, uh, as part of their job, uh, you're probably wondering, well, you know, if, if we have employee or customer data on random personal devices, you know, we have to have some ability to account for that. And, uh, you know, there's, there's laws that are triggered by the fact that it exists on those devices now, not, not you know, GDPR, CCPA, and it's, it's, it's newer predecessor, CC, uh, or the, the newer law, CCPR, that just came into effect recently. Uh, all of those are going to, you know, potentially trigger different, uh, different requirements for a company to comply. And so if you're in an industry like healthcare, finance, credit reporting, or really anything that deals with consumer data uh, or information about, you know, how they pay, what they do, uh, you know, you can potentially have compliance issues related to your data being on those computers. It's something you should be aware of and uh, start thinking about how to return that data. So what, we, what we're calling it is re repatriation of data. And so one of the ways you can do that is through data mapping is, you know, really try to look at what employees are out there that that would have had access to protected information, either HR data or data about your, your customers. And if they do have data about customers, is it is it sensitive data? If it's just an email address and a name, it's not enough. But if there's more information, like if they can see, you know, full credit card or things like that, uh, you know, that's something that you might be concerned about. And if so, you should start thinking about how are we going to reintroduce that data into our network safely? Uh, because right now you've got potentially you've got an employee who has information about various customers on their computer and you need, you want to get it back. You want to get it into the environment, get it off of their computer and really migrate it back into the controlled environment of the enterprise. And so, you know, this is something that, uh, I think is, is, is already happening. A lot of companies are already realizing, Hey, we got to find a way to get the data back. And so, uh, we've, we've actually seen companies having kind of a, a policy of, you know, no questions asked, you know, if you have this kind of data, contact us, we'll help you get it back in and you won't get in trouble. Uh, and, and that's been pretty successful because I think a lot of employees said, well, if I come forward and say I was storing this data on, you know, something that wasn't a, a, a corporate, uh, corporate property, you know, I could be in trouble and I don't want to do that. I'll just kind of sneak it in myself or whatever. And, you know, to really address that, we've we've talked to some companies who had like an amnesty program of if you come forward and just share the data back or help us get it off of those devices, then you're you're not going to be in trouble. So that's something to consider if you are in one of the industries, especially that could have sensitive information with employees that that may have put it on personal devices. It is consider a program like that that kind of removes the fear of being in trouble from the equation. Uh, because the benefits of the company is as soon as you can get the data off of the, their personal device and remediate it, uh, then you have control of it again. And you can resume applying your normal data retention, your data privacy controls, all the things that you had uh, pre-COVID, even litigation holds. You know, all of that can be put back in place and you can start resuming normal operations uh, about how you protect your data, how you manage your data, and, and how you store your data. So uh, we can go to the next slide. So I wanted to talk about some uh, some mitigation techniques in general about um, you know surrounding cybersecurity and data protection. So we can go to the next slide. And these are just these are general uh, techniques that I think if you have an ongoing remote workforce, which a lot of companies still have right now, uh, these are some tips that I wanted to provide. And I, I've put them in a the form of a question uh, so that you can easily go to your IT departments and, uh, and, and take this as a printout and say, hey, uh, what are we doing in these areas? And, and really try to get a sense of what's being done to protect the company now. So what we'd like to see ideally is, you know, a, a year ago from now or a year, a year back from today, you know, things were a rush. Everyone was trying to get everyone to remote work, to get their normal job duties done. And today, what we're seeing is companies saying, you know, this has been around for a while. If we haven't gotten around to putting some controls around this situation, it's time to do so. And so this, this list is main, mainly to help you kind of issue spot within your organizations to find out whether or not you're doing what should be done to protect your data, your IP, your trade secrets, your customer data, your employee data. So uh, the first one we'll go through is secure data access. Uh, you know, use a VPN. If your company's not set up to have a VPN, it's it's a it's a very good way of making sure that your the data in transit, that that being the data that comes to and from 
your employee's computer itself is protected. Uh, it's especially good if, you're if your employees are now going out to coffee shops, or other things that are partially open and getting on unsecured Wi-Fi. It's, it's very important that they have uh, protection for their connection uh, from untrusted networks like that. If you, um, if you do have a VPN, uh, it's also important to know what devices are you going to allow access to? Is it, are you going to allow, allow a home computer or personal computer of your employee to connect to your network? And the reason you might not want to do that is because within your organization, you probably have very, uh, very good enterprise grade antivirus or anti-malware software. That's probably not the case with your employee's home laptop they got from Best Buy or wherever they got it. And so what, what happens is, is if you've got those employees connecting their personal device to your network, your network may now have whatever risk that employee device had uh, by virtue of being connected. And so if you do enable VPN, make sure that you have some ability to control a pre-scan of that device before it's connected to your network, make sure it's clean or install enterprise uh, grade software, uh, you know, onto your employees' personal devices is kind of an extension of your own license. Uh, so that's that's one thing I wanted to to cover is kind of the you know data access component. The second one is virtual machines. You know, are you using something like a Citrix or similar to allow uh, employees to use whatever device they want, whether personal or otherwise, uh, but just really access a computer that's in your own private cloud, uh, so that they don't have to deal with a VPN or personal device uh, use for data storage. And there's things you can do in those to actually make sure that data doesn't come out of them. In the in your IT administrator settings in Citrix, you can set policies that say that you can't copy and paste out of it. So data that's in the environment of your enterprise stays in your environment and doesn't get onto those personal devices. So that's something to think about. I would also look at re revisiting your password policies, make sure that you have two-factor authentication on, especially for any web mail that you allow uh, employees to access from personal devices. It's one of the ways we see breaches happen is reuse of passwords. That's one of the most common and not having two-factor authentication. Those are the top two by far. So I would absolutely look at what your policies say about password reuse, how often passwords should be changed, and whether you can enable two-factor authentication like a duo security or, or something similar to that. Microsoft has one as well. So there's a lot of ways to do it. If you have Office 365, you already might have access to it. Uh, the last one is secure collaboration. How are we allowing uh, remote workers to collaborate better? Obviously, we've got all these wonderful webinar tools and you know our you know Zoom, WebEx, GoToMeeting, all these things for you know for live in-person streaming of of uh, communication. But what about sharing files? Do we have something that's a corporate sanctioned version, like a OneDrive or a, you know Dropbox for enterprise that that allows us to to know where data is and control access, and still allows employees to share and interact the way they want to? So that's another area I would look at. Next slide. Uh, these are the last three. So employee training is really important because this really, uh, th a lot of times what we see in breaches and data theft incidents is uh, is just employees not recognizing threats and mitigating them. And so uh, I can't stress enough that if you're not training your employees, you're only doing security half right because the you can have as many technical controls as you want, but if your employees click a link that they shouldn't or open a document they shouldn't or start replying on an email thread, you know, with with sensitive information, it becomes very easy to be a target that is exploited. So I would say train your employees, test your employees. Uh, we always evangelize using phishing testing services to actually fish your own employees and test how well they do. And that'll, that'll give you a good sense about how much they're paying attention in the cybersecurity training. And usually when they get fished, then they get self-enrolled in, uh, in more training. So it's kind of a it's a good feedback cycle, you know, to understand how employees are reacting to uh, to to these threats and and allows you to get ahead of it. Uh, the next one, increase email security. So this is this is one that I see uh, very infrequently being done, but has a uh, a very very big impact on the ability to protect your organization. What this does is if you're if you're getting threatening emails from an, uh, a hacker, essentially, if they include a link or if they include a, a, a bad Excel file or PDF, uh, this system will automatically scan the incoming emails. It'll open that link. It'll open that document in a 
cloud computer, nowhere near your environment, outside of uh, your employee's Outlook or whatever email system, and before the employee gets the email. And then once, once it opens it, it'll analyze it, determine if it's malware, ransomware, et cetera, or maybe it's clean, and then it'll make an automatic determination based on what happens, and then it'll either deliver the email or it'll trash the email and block the sender. So that's another thing that you can look at uh, to mitigate some threats. And the last one I want to talk about is tracking access to data. And this is something that, um, you know, for trade secrets and other IP is, is really important, uh, especially in the threat landscape we're in where attackers typically will get into systems and then try to find network shares to exfiltrate. And what we've seen, uh, I've seen a lot of these in the last months, is that the average, I would say the average data breach that has exfiltration that I've seen in the last six months is averaged between 60 and 120 gigabytes of data being stolen. And if, if, the, um, if the affected victim company doesn't pay the ransom, uh, you know, which is part of the, the kind of first attack of, uh, of encrypting the data, what the attackers and, and, and hackers are doing now are saying, oh, well, if you're not gonna pay the ransom, we're gonna post your data online. And then they leak it on the dark web. And so those things that you, that you were asserting trade secret protection over, if it's in there and you don't pay that, ex, that extortion demand, your trade secrets are gonna be posted publicly. So this is, you know, I'm talking a lot about cybersecurity only because it's very relevant to this discussion about, you know, protecting workers and protecting data. So uh, I would be very careful if, you, if you're the victim of one of those attacks because uh, these threat actors will post it and it's a lot of data. And, and in some cases, it can be more than that. We've seen it more than that. We've seen it less than that. But you don't want to be in a position of having to determine what data did they take. Uh, so access logs are good because if they do get in and your logs are kept on a separate server, you might be able to know what they took and determine whether or not you should be paying that ransom. Next slide. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague to uh, to take over from here. Uh, All right. Matt, I can I, I can actually take this one. So okay. one of the things we'll do uh, for for like a if you're thinking about terminating remote workers, is is figure out how are you what are you going to do to get your data back. Let's say you're going to be you're going to be sending an employee uh, on their way. And they've got a corporate laptop and maybe some access to different things. You know, how do you really, how do you really make sure you're getting everything back that you should get back? So one of the things I try to say is make sure you know what they have, uh, and that's typically asset tracking. So if you issue a laptop to an employee, make sure you know what the laptop is, who has it, when they got it, what kind of laptop it is, what serial number is on it, and ideally, what serial number the hard drive is internally. And the reason I say that to that level of depth is occasionally we've seen employees who get really cute with returning their their devices and they'll actually pull the hard drive of the original laptop and replace it with a new one uh, that's blank or they'll try to you know reinstall windows over it or something else and so knowing that that the laptop and the hard drive match what they were originally issued it's pretty critical in knowing whether you're actually getting your data back you can also limit both technically and by corporate policy uh, the use of personal devices, services, and storage to ones that the company sanctions. So this would be things like a BYOD policy. If you're allowing employees to bring their own cell phones, if you're allowing them to use cloud storage, uh, make sure that they're, you know, that those are written down and and employees know what they can and cannot be using in the operation of their of, of their business uh, or their day to day work. You want to make sure that the timing of termination and asset recovery is close in time. Uh, what we see often, and I, I am sure, you know, Bob, you and I have had many cases where an employee is terminated and the laptop is, is still in limbo for a week or more. Uh, and, you know, this is a big risk because we often get into the forensics, uh, the digital forensics of these situations. And we find that during that time, there's a lot of activity, even though they're no longer an employee, they're using it. Uh, they could be taking information off of it. And, you know, by the time the company gets it back, you know, the entire thing could have been copied off. So what we try to say is if you're going to be terminating a remote employee, try to time it so that there's a messenger at their door getting that laptop close in time to when they learn about the termination. You don't want to give them too much opportunity to mess around on that machine. 
Uh, other things you can do is if, if you've got the ability to issue, uh, to install remote software, use a tool like Cypherth Scout. Um, this is a, a platform I developed uh, in the last year that allows uh, allows you to see into a computer and, and what's going on in terms of like activity, which includes USB activity, internet activity, uh, file activity, what's being opened, what's being looked at, and things like that. So think about those those technical things. But in addition, try to use the exit interview to discover additional devices. Ask them where they were storing data. Uh, was it only on your corporate laptop? What about your personal laptop? Oh, you don't have one? What about your phone? You have an iPad. You know, ask those questions. What about USB devices? It's a great opportunity to, to, to know uh, or to, to have a better chance of learning where data might exist. And then naturally keep logs of employee activity. Any, any logins to webmail uh, or, you know, the system in general should be kept. VPN logs should be kept. All of that helps build a story, especially if you ever need the services of of Matt, Bob, or myself, uh, anytime we have logs, it really enhances our ability to look at what happened. Next slide. Okay, now we'll turn it over to my colleague. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Rick. Uh, my name is Matt Simmons. I'm in the Houston office of Cypher Shaw. I'm gonna be talking about the pre-termination checklist and actual termination. Uh, strategies and considerations for the remote workforce. Next slide. All right, best practices uh, for the remote environment. Uh, what better time with all the busy deadlines and other novel issues uh, that you're going through right now with remote workforce um, and other economic factors, but it is actually a good time to reevaluate uh, the procedures and revise them to account for workforce that hasn't been and may never come back into the office. Um, now, this is just a list of possible practices and agreements for your consideration. You know, many of these decisions are business decisions. Uh, some are costly, take up human capital, resources, time to effectively monitor. Uh, but the overarching goal is to mitigate the risk of misappropriation and unfair competition uh, the best you can uh, for a remote workforce and to ensure that your confidential, confidential information and documents remain confidential. Uh, the first one is confidential information. Most employment agreements have a confidential information um, covenant within it, uh, even though some states like Texas, where I am, uh, you, you have a common law of duty and obligation uh, protections that essentially covers the same thing. Uh, but many of the confidential information covenants that I see are boilerplate ones that were taken off of some online template, you know, 10, 20 years ago, or you don't know where they came from. And the confidential information and the types of confidential information has absolutely nothing to do with the company, the way it operates, the industry that it's in. And as a litigator, uh, you know, I, I think this is a missed opportunity. Uh, you know, I'm not saying, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that uh, it should be a narrow provision, right? Uh, but just that the, the covenants and the, the types of uh, explanation within the confidential information uh, covenant actually be indicative of your company, of your industry. Uh, in many situations, whenever you're operating in a jurisdiction, uh, that that is uh, only allows very narrow non-competes or no non-competes at all. This is an alternate method that we use as litigators to sue the company for breach of contract in order to protect the company and its assets. Um, another thing is a BYOD policy: bring your own device, uh, cell phones, laptops. You know, this is one of those cost-benefit analysis, right? Uh, you know, it's a high cost to prevent or to, to provide, um, you know, cell phones and laptop to every single employee. Uh, but it sure does help control and prevent the company information from leaving the company safeguards. Uh, you know, if you're just giving a, a stipend for a data plan, uh, you know, it's a lot harder to ensure the appropriate deletion of company information that may be stored on those devices upon termination. Uh, obligation to up, update location of employee. So this is becoming very important in the remote 
uh, worker workspace because uh, even for employment tax reasons, right? Uh, but the location of the employee likely drives which court and what substantive law is controlling when attempting to enforce one of these non-competes or, or, you know, breach contracts. Uh, and we've seen, and I'm sure you have too, migration um, of sorts once employees actually realize they can work from anywhere and they don't have to live close to the office. Um, or even the same time zone. You know, people going to lake houses, different states, living with elderly parents, moving closer to adult children. Uh, you know, we've had a several uh, that get into the data privacy realm uh, that want to work uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, and that, that comes into some data privacy and some of those other laws that, uh, that Rick mentioned uh, on actually being able to share that information across uh, country lines. Uh, so that's really important to uh, include that in a, a new policy. Uh, notice the resignation period. Bob will cover that uh, a little bit later. Uh, touching on what Rick said, non-use of personal email or cloud accounts. You know, it's common sense. If an employee is in the office, that they're not going to be working, doing work email through their personal email or cloud devices. Uh, now, just like Rick said, the excuse is, well, the VPN's always down, or sometimes I'm having trouble to access these key documents to service my clients, and I just sent these to my personal email or my personal cloud account to ensure that I have access so that I can effectively do my job. You know, early on, that may have actually been a valid excuse. Uh, but once the, inf once the information leaves uh, your work protected environment, it has to be repatriated to your system uh, and deleted, or the company isn't adequately protecting its confidential information. If you don't adequately protect your confidential information, you know, there's a good argument that it's no longer confidential information that you can protect. Um, you know, company asset, hard copy document tracking, again, may only be appropriate for some companies uh, and not others, but, you know, requiring employees to log in uh, or make records of any hard documents that they take from the office or print out, thumb drives, um, laptop projectors, MiFi's, all that stuff really goes to what assets do, do the employees have and what do I need to expect whenever I'm doing a pre-termination assessment to figure out what we need to get back. Uh, echoing similar to what Rick said, training. Uh, policies, especially new ones, that change the way the employee operates and your expectations of the employee are only good if the employee knows that they're there and knows what the expectations are. Um, updated restricted covenants. Now, again, may not be for every employee, every jurisdiction, um, but if you are updating all these policies and procedures, it's a good time to update everything. Um, the biggest thing whenever you're updating or revising a restricted covenant is consideration. You know, most jurisdictions allow employers to revise or even add restricted covenants to employee agreements. Uh, but additional consideration must be given. Typically, continued employment is not enough. However, uh, it can be something as simple as a new client list, leads, uh, et cetera. Uh, but the caveat, again, is the closer you provide that consideration, whether it's confidential information, a stipend, stock options, whatever, the closer in time that you provide that consideration to the time that you have them uh, sign the updated or amended uh, non-compete agreement, the more enforceable it'll be. Um, and so that's, that's important to uh, enforcing the restricted covenants in the courts so that they'll choose the new one over the old one. Um, so do it, uh, do the modification and make sure that you document that you actually provide uh, the consideration to the employee uh, 2016 Defend Trade Secrets Act, uh, if you have a key employee that was hired on after 2016, you will not have the required notice provision uh, in your non-compete agreement. 
And, uh, you know, there's a particular notice provision that the Act requires for federal lawsuits. Uh, and if you don't have that particular notice, then you can't get prevailing party attorney's fees, uh, which, as we all know as litigators on the panel, that that's really one of the very few types of damages that's easily calculable in these types of unfair competition lawsuits. Uh, state statute and case law modifications, uh, even state law, that's been state law for a long time. Uh, case law interpretations of state law is somewhat of a moving target, right? Because the more cases and the more fact patterns in those cases really provides a better framework of what is most likely to be held enforceable. Um, so know those, those things or get with your, your counsel to know um, how to best modify your agreements under the current framework and understanding of the, the statute, statute for that particular jurisdiction. Uh, my next one is local ordinances. So this is, uh, President Biden stated uh, that he's in favor of removing non uh except for rare circumstances. Washington, D.C. recently enacted an almost complete non-compete ban uh, on March 16th uh, of this year it became effective. Other notable states uh, that have recent enactments, Maryland in 2019, Virginia in 2020, uh, passed uh, laws barring non-competes for low-wage earners. Uh, Maryland's is about 30,000, Virginia's is about 62,000. So depending on how that law is enforced, uh, you know, a guaranteed base versus total comp, which includes commissions and bonus, that may include a lot of your salespeople, which are the ones that you're exactly trying to make sure that they don't unfairly compete. This all delves into where's the employee working, right? Um, and, you know, the reason to keep track of that. Along with that, there's clearly been a growing uh, inclination for local governments to get involved in the employment space most notably the, the paid sick leave laws, right, or ordinances. And so I fully expect that uh, a lot of these local governments, uh, especially in major metropolitan areas, are going to attempt to pass similar bans uh, on non uh especially on low-wage earners. Um, so I, I think that will happen in the next few years, uh, and so that's something to, to keep apprised of. Next slide. All right, the assessment. Really, the assessment's all about how can the newly terminated employee potentially hurt your business? Uh, so get to know their contacts, their recent pitches. Um, you know, that's important for who, who you think that they're, they're gonna solicit as employees, or even who do you think they're gonna go to after termination to request confidential information. And like if they have a buddy in their team and they're at a new place or want to start up a new company, you know, that's who they typically email uh, to get that information from the company. Uh, again, location of employee, not just for the enforcement uh, jurisdiction, but also where do you send the courier? Uh, where do you send the box to get all the documents and laptops back? Uh, you know, Look at their recent pitches, look at their expense reports, if they've done any business development. Uh, these are all their potential targets, right? Uh, company property versus per personal property. Last thing you want to do is to show up and take something that's not yours. So know what's yours, know what's theirs. Uh, same thing for hard copy files. Uh, phone number ownership, if it's a BYOD versus it's your device. If it's your device, uh, you know, that's your number. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't give back uh, former employees' numbers that they've had since high school, but, uh, you know, sometimes it takes time to port over a number, and that gap allows you time to uh, make sure that uh, they don't unfairly compete during that time. Uh, access to their OneDrive personal email accounts. You know, we need to understand what they have access to within the company system. So you make sure that you disable their access to it. Uh, same thing with business credit cards and financial accounts. What do they have access to so that you can ensure that they don't have access to it upon termination? Next slide. Uh, compliance assessment. So you've got the policies and procedures, you've done an assessment. 
uh, about the particular person, now have they complied with it? Um, you know, I always think doing a pre-termination forensic search a few days before, look for their personal email that they either have on their notes and contacts or that they uh, used in their um, employment application. Uh, that's typically good uh, for finding out whether they've sent documents to themselves, whether they've printed things. Look at what they've recently accessed. Sometimes where it gets out that they're going to get terminated if they're looking only at client lists, not just theirs, but others, you know, that should be a good indication that they know it's coming and they're planning something. Um, so, and also do a second search the day of the termination. Uh, for a remote deletion meeting, coordinate with IT, HR, identify company files, and typically have a deletion declaration template ready to go. Next slide. All right, the actual termination. Next slide. Uh, so, it used to be, right, that you would try to terminate an employee late on a Friday afternoon so they wouldn't cause a disruption. That's not really as much of a concern for a remote worker, right? It can still happen, but it's not as prevalent because access can be shut off almost immediately. Um, you know, also now with the need sometimes for a potential deletion meeting it to repatriate documents back to your system, it's good to do it in the morning so that you have time that very afternoon to do that deletion meeting to get everything done in one day. So it gives you some, some breathing room. Um, calendar invite, this is the biggest one. If, if an employee gets a calendar invite from their third level supervisor or the HR or you know, GC or someone in the legal team, they're gonna know something's up. And whenever they do that, that's exactly whenever they're not thinking and they start stealing stuff. Um, seen it happen time and time again. Uh, so whenever you do it, um, you know, do a calendar invite the day before typically because you need to make sure they're on video and they're at their home whenever you do it, uh, but only do it for the, their first level supervisor even though everybody else is gonna be on the call. Um, you know, just like I said before, email cloud access account, make sure that it's all terminated. Uh, access to the home workspace. You know, this is a super gray area. I wouldn't recommend it unless they sign like a consent form or something like that. Uh, otherwise, if they have documents or devices or information, um, you know, you may need to go to a court to get an injunctive relief to obtain them. Um, even if they do allow you in and sign a consent form, you know, maybe even videoing it, make sure you have a witness that, you know, make sure that everything is good, just like we do in, you know, certain asset seizures. Remind them of their post-employment obligations. Uh, reminder letter from the company, always include a copy of any non-compete, non-solicit agreement. And uh, sometimes a reminder letter from outside counsel. Many of my clients want a reminder from an outside lawyer uh, when an employee stole information or attempted to steal information or going to a competitor. Uh, it ensures that they actually go to the deletion meeting and you can also send on a request to the new employer to let them know, hey, these are the documents that are taken or potentially taken, search your system uh, so that you don't have them. So um, at this time, I'll go ahead and pass it along to Bob and uh, the Atlanta office. Great, thanks, Matt, I appreciate that. Uh, just real quick before we move on to the next section, uh, I want to give the CLE code. This code will be required on your CLE verification form. The code is SS8738. That's S as in Cyparth. S as in Cyparth 8738. Again, it's SS8738. Now let's continue. In the, the section I'm going to talk about, and if we can go to the next slide, would be great. Thank you. Uh, it's a little bit different than what Matt was talking about and kind of what Rick was talking about. So my scenario is uh, somebody resigns abruptly. You're surprised. And, you know, unfortunately, many of us have been here before. You're caught off guard. You didn't see it coming. Uh, and you've got this now completely remote employee. It's not like they're in the office resigning from you. Uh, they're completely remote. And you, you know, you're, there's no the, the days of people walking out with boxes are long gone. 
uh, that eight people walking out at all often are gone now because they're all remote. Uh, your mind needs to be thinking immediately about how you can protect and recapture your assets, uh, both physical, like your hardware, your computers, your phones, to the extent you have them, and more importantly, electronic, because as you see on here, electronic information can be, and you're probably all familiar with this, and employees are getting more creative, but they continue to take information, particularly when they've planned a departure. Uh, and you know, just, just so you know, during COVID, one of the things we've seen, kind of like Rick mentioned, uh, with respect to hackers taking advantage of employers quickly moving to remote and not protecting all of their information, we've also seen uh, companies going out, who are, or competitors of other companies, and taking advantage of employees being remote constantly. And so they have a, an easier way to reach out to them. They're not in the office. They're not taking a vacation day. So we've seen some real uptick in employees moving jobs uh, and taking information with them uh, when they resign. So just what we have on the screen here, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but this is the kinds of ways that we see uh, employees taking information prior to their departure uh, that you should be you know, thinking about. One of the things that's very important, and as, as they mentioned before, uh, is, is Rick and Matt mentioned, there are numerous ways you can prevent this on the front end, and we would heavily encourage it. You know, to the extent you can limit personal email accounts, to the extent you can limit personal cloud storage, personal computers, no external hard drives, you can limit printing of certain information from their home. All of these types of things protect your information from being disclosed or stolen. You know, and some can be protected through policy, like the BYOD policy. However, that policy needs to be enforced. So if a manager starts getting uh, E per emails from someone's personal email account and doing work with them, then it becomes a problem because now they've condoned uh, use of personal emails. So if you have a, you know, a policy that says you can't use personal emails, then you need to follow that policy. Other stuff can be protected through agreements, as Matt mentioned, non-disclosure agreements, non-compete agreements. You can also protect stuff through IT measures, uh, as Rick mentioned earlier. You can limit printing. You can block the use of external drives, things like that. You can also limit things through the hardware. You know, Matt mentioned uh, getting people uh, phones that are owned by the company. That's a cost-benefit analysis that probably many CFOs would say, we're not going to buy them a phone. That's too expensive. Uh, but you got to think about that because if you, if you own the phone or you own the number, it does limit uh, what they can do with that. You can stop phone calls. You can, your clients are going to have, customers are going to have that telephone number to reach out to that person. If that numbers coming into the uh, employer as opposed to the new employee who's at a new employer uh, that provides protection, but it can be very expensive uh, to do that. And, and obviously you want to have, uh, if you have a work issue computer or a thin client where they're connecting to a virtual network and they can't use uh, their own computer, then, uh, then that would be helpful as well to provide you additional protection on the front end. The more you can protect your information from disclosure on the front end, the better. Now, if we can go to slide two, please. So there's a lot of information on this screen, but you know things you should think about uh, when somebody resigns abruptly. Uh, and first of all, I want you to think about this. Most employees do not misappropriate data information. And they don't do it to intentionally harm their employer. But those that do create real problems and chaos and can result in substantial business loss. Uh, and having to hire lawyers or professionals, you know, like Rick and Matt and myself to help you recover assets and information after it's already been disclosed or used against you uh, in a competitive way. So when somebody resigns abruptly, uh, IT needs to be notified as soon as possible so that access can be disabled with respect to email, cloud accounts, phone, systems like that. Uh, do that as quickly as you can. You know, Rick mentioned earlier that if you could have auditing software, if you have auditing software, uh, you can run that auditing software. IT can run it and find out what's been going on. Has this employee been printing information? Have they been working after hours repeatedly? Have they been downloading information? Uh, you can often, you know, if you use something like Cyforce Scatter, you have your own auditing material uh, capabilities. You can find out if they plug in external hard drives. 
if there's been unauthorized cloud storage. So those types of things will give you a peek into what has been going on with respect to this employee prior to their departure that might result in you losing information. Matt mentioned the notice period before, to the extent you can give an employee, work with them on a notice period while managing their access, that would be good. It gives you time to figure out what's going on and whether or not there are potential concerns regarding the loss of information. Uh, an exit interview can be excellent. You can have your manager or HR professional sit down and find out where they're going, making sure your assets are being returned, all of those types of things uh, are extremely important to doing stuff. Uh, and tra you can also transition things properly to a new employee who may be taking over for this person uh, when they leave. Then talk about uh, identifying assets. And if you did what Rick suggested and you have an asset key on the front end, so you knew what assets they have from a hardware perspective, computers, screens, phones, things like that, then you should request those things to be returned. To provide them with a FedEx or a UPS, uh, or you can meet them in person. Perhaps you cannot in the COVID world, but get them that FedEx stuff as soon as possible and follow up with it. You know, one things we have seen, I've seen it repeatedly, is the manager sends them the, the FedEx package or HR does, and it takes them a long time to actually send the computer back. Sometimes it never happens until you're three months down the road and you're like, where's the computer? but you didn't have people following up to see where it was. You know, Rick and I have also seen where the computer gets returned, but then you can't find it. Who did it actually get mailed to? So then you gotta, if you do FedEx or UPS, obviously you can track it and you can find out who signed for it, but you'd like to get the computer returned uh, and make sure that you have a way to track it and get it done as quickly as possible. Something else to think about uh, when you get that computer returned is what are you gonna do with the computer and how quickly are you going to reissue the computer? And I'll talk about that in a minute. You do want to remind the employee of their non-disclosure, non-compete obligations. Uh, verbally would be good with the HR uh, or the manager during an exit interview would be a perfect time to do that. Uh, but that's something that you're going to want to do to the extent they have such obligation. You're obviously going to identify any con contacts, or clients, or customers if applicable uh, to take steps to protect those relationships, and then give thought to where are they going? Are they going to a competitor? Obviously, if they're going to a competitor, then you may not want them to be working at a notice period with you, certainly not one where they have access to any systems. So if we can jump to the next screen, please. So when you learn that someone has abruptly resigned, here are some checklists of things you should consider doing with them. You know, First thing you're going to want to do, obviously, one of the first things is talk with other team members. Who is going to backfill? Who's going to talk to these uh, other customers or clients to make sure that their work is being taken care of? You need to make sure that those team members are not also about to depart. You know, sometimes we'll see staggered departures of people, uh, and you want to make sure that you're monitoring those other employees, particularly if there's, as Matt mentioned, someone who's a good friend of somebody who might be following their lead. You want to track the projects, and you can go onto LinkedIn uh, and find out social media, find out kind of where people are going, uh, if they've identified that. You know, now, I, I will tell you that uh, in one of the recent cases I've had, you, you think about kind of where people are going and what they're doing. You know, just because someone's a good employee, has always been a good employee, doesn't mean that they're not out trying to compete against you. I've got a current case where an employee abruptly resigned to spend time with their aging parents during COVID in a bubble, told their boss, hey, I just need a break, uh, but they had no new employment. They provided no notice, and the manager just assumed this is a great employee, nothing nefarious is going on. Uh, she would never lie or take data. Turns out that, a, that manager could not have been more wrong. Uh, she did take data. She carefully and deliberately planned out her departure. Uh, she forwarded emails. She copied information, but the employer didn't do any of this auditing stuff immediately because they just assumed that this was a great employee who would never do anything nefarious. And so you've got to be proactive about trying to preserve data and to get it back. And if you have that auditing software, utilize it as quickly as possible. And in that scenario, they went on LinkedIn, but there was no change to the LinkedIn uh, profile. So the next bullet on the page you'll see is the preservation of data and information. 
obviously the return of the devices is very important and making sure that it gets returned to the right person and IT uh, and is able to track it, uh, making sure things are disabled. Then the third bullet I think is important, uh, and it's a balancing act. Consider waiting before reissuing or wiping the device. You know, the IT oftentimes, uh, and the CFO as well, like we're not going to buy a new computer. We've got a computer back. Let's wipe it. Let's reimage it. And let's get it back out to a new, a new employee rather than spending money to buy another computer. Uh, of course, the problem with that is you may lose information, uh, the ability to find out if somebody plugged in a USB drive into that computer uh, or things like that. So uh, to the extent you can wait some period of time before reissuing the computer, that would be preferable. Uh, from a litigation perspective, if you could image it first before you reissue, it would be great. Uh, not everybody can afford that cost or want to incur that cost. But to the extent you could wait, that would be great uh, before do that, doing that. Also, monitor the employee's email account to the extent they're working with customers. Uh, customers at the new employer, they may end up coming back and sending emails to the old employment uh, email account. So monitor that account and see if uh, a customer comes back to it and tells you where they've gone. And then obviously preserve the email account uh, at least for a period of time. You know, I would suggest at least six months before the, uh, it is deleted, if at all possible. Uh, the last bullet here is sometimes you have to take legal steps. You know, the reminder letter, as Matt mentioned, is something you can do both internally or using a outside law firm. And then ultimately you may have to file a TRO depending upon, or a lawsuit seeking injunctive relief for a TRO depending upon what's going on with a departed employee to actually get your information back. You've requested it back, you've used all of the proactive measures you can to get it back, sometimes you will have to file a lawsuit. Uh, and you can do that. I'm gonna you know, go to the next slide. And so just real quick in the last couple of minutes that we have, you know, one of the things that we've seen is COVID has had a real impact on using this measure, a lawsuit, to get information back from former employees because uh, the ability to kind of get into court. So if we can jump to the to the next slide. And so, you know, one of the things, if you have to file a lawsuit and seek a temporary restraining order, ordering the return of your data and perhaps uh, enjoining somebody from competing or soliciting customers is that a TRO is equitable relief. So is it fair? And so going into courts now, you know, we've had many of these that we've had to deal with. You know, now we're dealing with Zoom hearings rather than in person. And so what you've seen is a procedure for gaining access is different. You can't just run down to the courthouse with papers, get in to see the court that day. You've got to deal with it all via telephone or email. Uh, so the process is different. It's a slower process. Uh, it still can be done very quickly, but it can be a slow process. Uh, you'll hear from judges, is this really an emergency? I've got people in hospitals dying. You know, I've got real TROs I need to deal with. Is your loss of customer data uh, or competitive information, is it really an emergency? So if you're gonna go in and seek a TRO right now, in this environment, it really needs to be an emergency. Something else to think about is the geographies are changing if you have a non-compete, for example. People, as Matt mentioned, are working remotely and your geography may say 25 miles from the office. So they may not be in the office. So that's something to think about. Uh, and the courts look really hard at that. Say, well, it's not, this person's not in that 25 mile period. They've, they've moved somewhere else or they're sitting there but they're making phone calls outside of it so they're not actually competing there. Uh, so these are things that courts are considering as what, what is equitable. Uh, obviously if they've stolen information, courts are much more uh, willing to move forward quickly if you can demonstrate information has been uh, misappropriated. Uh, and you can demonstrate the efforts that you've taken to try to protect it on the front end and when they actually departed. So I'm not gonna go through all of them, uh, but those are kind of some highlights that we've been seeing in courts as they're really looking real hard at uh, is a request for a TRO, an emergency, given the pandemic that's going on uh, and all the public health considerations. So if we can jump to the last slide. So I'm sorry I kind of jumped through that real quick. I was trying to kind of keep us on, uh, on target, uh, but we really do appreciate uh, uh, your consideration today. If you have any questions,
feel free to kind of put those into the Q&A. And uh, with that, on behalf of Rick and Matt and Cypark, we appreciate uh, your time today. Thank you.